Monday, Thursday, it's not Monday, Thursday, but Monday from the Latin mandatum, meaning commandment, a new commandment I give to you. And this commandment, of course, includes love, but it also includes the love meal, the love feast, uh, starting way back in the Passover meal with that word remembrance, uh, even though not said directly, but certainly indicated that it's a meal that they were to partake of to remember the deliverance, the mighty deliverance, and the plagues, and the outstretched hand, and the pillar of fire, and the parting of the sea, and the destruction of Pharaoh's armies, and then carrying over until the night, that night of all nights, the night when starts off with a foot washing to show that this Lord, this King, is a servant who comes in humility to suffer to take on our sin upon himself and to die on the cross. Included in those words of what we call the verba, the, the setting aside of this bread and this wine for communion, is the whole idea of, of remembering and real presence. Tonight we do both. We start off remembering on the night of his betrayal, he took bread. We remember what he did for us. We remember what he gave to us. We remember the price he paid to make us his own, trading his righteousness for our unrighteousness so that we might live forever in heaven. And then he also gave us this body, this blood, this bread, this wine for? Help me out here. Say it out loud. Forgiveness of sins. That is what we are doing here. Remembering and receiving forgiveness once again. With that in mind, we rise for our opening hymn, The Death of Jesus Christ, Our Lord.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I will go to the altar of God. Hmm. I'll say it. To God our exceeding joy. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Please be seated. Death and the devil, all that prevents us from trusting in God and loving each other. Since it is our intention to receive the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which he strengthens our faith by giving us his body to eat and his blood to drink, therefore it is proper that we diligently examine ourselves, as St. Paul urges us to do. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort of those who are troubled because of their sin and who humbly confess their sins, fear God's wrath, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. But when we examine our hearts and consciences, we find nothing in us but sin and death from which we are incapable of delivering ourselves. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us. For our benefit, he became man so that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God, and to deliver us, took upon himself our sin and the punishment we deserve. So that we may more confidently believe this and be strengthened in the faith and in holy living, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. It is as if he said, I became man, and that all that I do and suffer is for your good. As a pledge of this, I give you my body to eat. In the same way, also he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Again, it is as if he said, I have had mercy on you by taking into myself all your iniquities. I give myself into death, shedding my blood to obtain grace and forgiveness of sins, and to comfort and establish the New Testament, which gives forgiveness and everlasting salvation. As a pledge of this, I give you my blood to drink. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, confidently believing the word and promise of Christ, dwells in Christ, and Christ in him, and has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, showing his death, that he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Giving him our most heartfelt thanks, we take up our cross and follow him, and according to his commandment, love one another as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are all partakers of this one bread and drink from the one cup. For just as the one cup is filled with wine of many grapes, and one bread made from countless grains, so also we, being many, are one body in Christ. Because of him, we love one another, not only in word, but in deed and in truth. May the almighty and merciful God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, accomplish this in us. Amen. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our sins to him, imploring him for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness first in a time of personal reflection and self-examination. I invite you to rise. Together we confess, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve a temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them 
and I pray thee of the house. Merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and at the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, surely he will do it. Go in peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. And, O oh Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifested in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for this evening is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting with verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is found in Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 15. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. The verse for this evening is from John 13. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where 
will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the New Testament, or New Covenant in my blood. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Lord Please remain standing for the hymn of the day when you woke that Thursday morning. song. 
please be seated. Pray briefly with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless, come before you this evening uh, in this utter time of mystery and miracles that you in a wonderful way have given to us the presence of yourself bodily, body and blood in bread and wine, that we might have something to hold on to, to have something in which to embody and envision the faith that we hold. We pray that as you told us that this is for you, we might truly know that it is for me. In Jesus' name, amen. In Christ Jesus, dear Christian friends, our text that we're going to use for this evening's message is one that is about as traditional as you can get for a Monday Thursday. It comes from uh, 1 Corinthians 11, the 23rd through 26th verses, uh, in which Paul addressed some words to the church at Corinth, uh, a church that was divided by various disagreements over a number of, of spiritual issues. And not the least of which among those was the proper reception of the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. So Paul writes by the Holy Spirit these words, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is our text. Tonight, uh, well, throughout the Lenten season, we uh, were focusing on something we called cross peace, how the, 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 the cross and everything associated with it points us to the peace that we have with God through Jesus' death on the cross, as well as his resurrection from the tomb. And tonight I want to take that a little step further that we'll get into in a moment. You know, this last Sunday, we celebrated uh, what we call Palm Sunday, uh, the observance of Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And we oftentimes, I think, get perhaps the impression that that's, that was the big thing going on, and certainly it was. All of those people welcoming Jesus into the city, following him into the city, waving the palm branches, and all of the celebration that appeared to be going on as they welcomed this one who had raised a man from the dead. After all, that's what had really caught their attention. That was the news that had spread to Jerusalem. But that wasn't the only activity going on in Jerusalem that day. In fact, this was a day that was always busy. Every year, this particular day in Jerusalem was very, very busy because the Jews were beginning their preparations for the upcoming Passover. And as Jesus rode into town on that colt, the, the donkey, many of the Jews were busy selecting the lamb that their family would slaughter on Thursday that week. Sunday was Lamb Selection Day, sort of like the day when you know might you go to the auction and pick out that best lamb that was available and and bring it home to be slaughtered on Thursday for the Passover. Passover Lamb Selection Day was that Sunday. Those lambs without blemish that were slaughtered in Jerusalem by the thousands that week. 
a lamb for every household that had gathered to observe this feast. That meant that in Jerusalem that week, blood flowed everywhere. Everywhere. A lamb slaughtered for every household. And all of those families that came to the city to observe this big Passover celebration. The feast, of course, as Pastor Halverson referred to earlier, recalled the Passover in Egypt, how the Israelites' firstborn had been spared from death by the blood of a lamb painted on the doorpost of the Hebrews' homes. After all, without blood, there was no salvation. Without the blood of a lamb, there was no salvation. And without trusting in God's promise that the blood of the lamb would save them, there was no salvation, was there? Blood on the outside for everybody to see, doing two things, not just one, two. It saved those who trusted in God's promise and it proclaimed the salvation of those who trusted in God's saving work. Two things. In other words, it did what it proclaimed. And it proclaimed what it did. Now, that's important because when we start looking at the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, it is very much the same way. And that's why we're... uh, adding to this cross here tonight. You probably can't see it very well from back there, and I didn't do a real good job of this, making that, but a little blood red cloth on top of that. Symbol of that, that blood that brings the forgiveness of sins. The blood of a perfect sacrifice whose death brought about the forgiveness of sins of all mankind, Jesus himself and sparing us from eternal death. And so it was that during this great feast where we find Jesus and his disciples in that that upper room, where Jesus instituted for us this wonderful sacrament, which is a a big deal. It's a big deal. Uh, It really is. And it's especially a big deal for those of us who have a correct understanding of what it's all about from Scripture. As was mentioned, this word mondi has associated with it the idea of a commandment. And in Jesus' case, in instituting the Lord's Supper, it's a new commandment. His last will and testament, as some describe it. A new commandment for us. Taking place at a, a fitting time and opportunity at the celebration of the Passover. Because like the blood on the doorposts, of the Israelites whom God was freeing from slavery in Egypt and protecting from the death of all the firstborn. The broken body and the blood shed of our Savior Jesus is what it proclaims. It does what it promises. Holy Communion in a very tangible way brings to each and every believer in Christ personally, the benefit of Jesus' perfect life and his sacrificial death. Not the, the blood of lambs like was observed in Jerusalem, which has no power to save, but the body and blood of Jesus, which cannot help but save us from the power of sin and death. It can do no other thing. And it is our repeated assurance of salvation through the redemption accomplished for us by Jesus on the cross. The repeated assurance that we have. So, what do we mean when we talk about, or what did Jesus mean when he talked about this this particular sacrament that he instituted? Oh, we hear that the, the part every, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper about take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me. But we don't very often focus on the last words. For as often, in other words, every single time, 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Well, exactly what is it we're proclaiming? What is it that participation in this sacrament by us says? Well, there's several points I want to make. There's, you're supposed to say three. I actually have five. <laughs> uh, f- first is that, and I, I want you to think about this as, as you individually. As you walk up this aisle each every, and every time you come to this, this table, what is being proclaimed as often as I eat this bread and drink this cup? Well, first of all, I'm proclaiming, standing up here in front of God and everybody else, that I'm a sinner. What a surprise. I proclaim that I'm a sinner that's in need of forgiveness. After all, as Paul writes, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one's excluded from that. We confess our sins before God and one another, and we hear the words of absolution that prepare us for the reception of his body and blood, don't we? Secondly, I proclaim, as I stand up here in this line waiting to commune with all the rest of you, I proclaim that I believe that Christ earned my forgiveness through his death on the cross. Scripture testifies to this all over over the place. In fact, in Hebrews we hear that without the shedding of, of blood, there is no forgiveness. And Paul writes in Ephesians, in him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, which is the forgiveness of sins. And we're told also in 1 John that if we walk in the light, in other words, if we are among God's people, if we are believers... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. We believe that that blood shed on the cross by Jesus forgives our sins. We proclaim that. Third point is, I proclaim that I receive this outward assurance of my complete forgiveness through this sacrament. What I receive in my hand what I taste in my mouth is my assurance that Christ's body and blood forgives all of my sins. For our sake, he was made sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You don't become perfect in God's eyes, without the forgiveness of sins, and you don't receive the forgiveness of sins without the shedding of Jesus' blood. And through faith, I have become a worthy recipient of Christ's body and blood and the assurance that it brings. That's what makes us worthy. Luther said it this way in our large catechism about our sins and how we should feel about them when approaching the Lord's Supper. He said, if you are burdened and feel your weakness, in other words, your sinful nature pulling you down, go joyfully to the sacrament and let yourself be refreshed, comforted, and strengthened. For if you wait until you're rid of that burden, or think you are, in order to come to the sacrament purely and worthily because you don't have any sins to worry about, you will stay away from it forever. Fourth point, I proclaim my thanks and my praise to God in both word and deed for what Jesus has done for me when I come personally to the Lord's table. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ, Paul writes? I proclaim that this wonderful act of Jesus, this sacrificial gift of Jesus, his body and his blood shed on the cross, broken on the cross, is not just for some nebulous world of people, 
but it is for me, and if I were the only one, it would have been for me alone. So these are the things that we proclaim when we come to the Lord's Supper. These are the things we admit to, the things we confess. But to whom is this proclamation made? Well, first of all, I want to point out that the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, and we have a a very specific and scriptural belief that follows along this, that the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, is not some form of evangelism. We don't invite the masses to participate in a sacred act that is designed for believers alone, designed for disciples, followers of Jesus alone. This is a fellowship meal, as Pastor mentioned at the beginning. It's a participation that is something that in something that is, yes, mysterious, yes, miraculous, but also very real. And we eat the bread and drink the cup of Christ's body and blood and proclaim our oneness with him and one another. And oneness in our confession of faith. We proclaim the unity and the fellowship that we share as the one body of Christ. Family gathering, a, a gathering of the baptized, we might say. It's our link to the believers of the past and those still to come and all of those with whom we have fellowship here in this hour. That's what this red cloth is all about, observing and participating in this fellowship until Jesus returns in glory, the body broken and the blood shed for you and for me. And that's the last point I want to to focus on, because I, I, I personally, the first time uh, I had not I had had communion when it was not from a uh, common cup. It seemed a little different to me because I'd only experienced common cup communion. But there's there's a for me aspect to this, of the wafer in my hand, and the cup in my hand, that has made it. I think, possible for me personally to have an even stronger feeling about that. And I want to tell you a little bit of a story and why why I feel that way. Because um, April 3rd, 1966 um, was Palm Sunday that year. And in the congregation where I grew up, Palm Sunday was always Confirmation Sunday. So those of us who were I was 13, I was one of the younger ones, but who were 8th graders that year were confirmed on April 3rd, 1966. And then we all observed together our first communion on, when would you think? Maundy Thursday. Maundy Thursday. So uh, on April 7th, 1966, I had my first communion. And... You know how things become, you know, you get accustomed to them. And I always have to think back to my first experience at the Lord's table whenever I come these days because the first is almost always the best. The first is almost always the most memorable. And I hope that that might be the case for you as well because this is what we are proclaiming. It isn't proclaiming to the world because the world isn't invited. It isn't proclaiming just to God so he can hear that I am once again confessing my sins and my faith in him. We proclaim to ourselves we proclaim to ourselves that Jesus died and rose for me. 
that his blood was shed for me. And that's what we proclaim. That's why he says, as often as you eat it and drink it, proclaim it to yourself that I believe and that Jesus has done this for me. He would have done it only for me. But he's done it for all of us. This is what we proclaim. We're to hear ourselves and see ourselves and and be here as ourselves to remind ourselves of what he has done for me. And that's what always brings me back to my first communion because that is the time I personally went from for you to for me. Amen. And what's next? Offering. We continue to worship with our offering. Please rise. Almighty Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, we pause and we thank you for this amazing gift, your son, freely, willingly, intentionally given for us to be the lamb that is perfect without sin, without blemish, to take our sin upon himself, and to suffer in our place, to die, that we would live forever. Lord, we do proclaim that and willingly share it. For Lord, it is through Christ alone that we enter into your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. 
It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, that where death arose, their life might also rise again, and that the serpent who overcame, who overcame by the tree of the garden might over likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the very night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given into death for the forgiveness of your sins. In the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the remission of all your sin. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
I'll try. 
Please remain seated while we pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, on Maundy Thursday, I'm going to ask, right by the way, that the usher or elder come forward and extinguish the candles now. On, uh, yeah, right now. <laughs> uh, on Monday, Thursday, the service is concluded with the, uh, yeah, you can just put them out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, we typically conclude um, with the uh, ceremony of, of stripping the altar. And you might wonder why we do this. Uh, it is, first of all, uh, a very ancient observance um, in which all of the ornamentation, the linens, the paraments, everything that you see on the altar that is decorative in nature um, is removed. Um, and, and the reason is because it is symbolic of the humiliation of Jesus uh, throughout, well, it began at his, his incarnation, but culminated at the hands of the soldiers. And after the Last Supper, of course, less than 24 hours remained in the earthly life of our Lord. And during that time, events moved very rapidly. You know, recall the prayer in Gethsemane, his betrayal by Judas, his arrest, the mock trial that took place, his beating, the crowning with thorns, the mockery, the, the spitting by the soldiers, the trudge to Golgotha, and then, of course, his shameful death. And as his life was stripped from him, so we strip our altar of the signs of life to symbolize his very purposeful, redemptive suffering and death for us and for our salvation. So even the plants like these palms, which, you know, exhibit life, are removed, um, very, very much showing how his life ebbed from him on that day. So in recognition of that, all these things will be removed and... Uh, uh, we will hear, as that is done, uh, the familiar words of Psalm 22. Did you read the psalm yet? Hmm? I did that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, O my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, in our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make their mouths at me. They wag their heads. He who trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have made, you have been my God. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls of Bashan surround me. Strong bulls encompass me. 
They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell you or tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he was not despised or abhorred and afflicted among the, of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise. In the great congregation, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kinship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who would not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. <laughs> 